this book, Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain, to see what he has to say about the founding of Leicester by King Lear around 800 BC. Now, Leicester, for those who don't know, is a city in the heart of England with some rather impressive Roman remains. And according to Geoffrey of Monmouth, Leicester is Leicester, where Cester is the old English word for fort, found in places like Bicester, Toaster, or Dorchester, Manchester, and many others. So Leicester would be Lear's fort. And many people have heard of King Lear because he was the subject of a play by William Shakespeare. But what's less widely known is that it goes back to this guy, Geoffrey of Monmouth, writing about 500 years before Shakespeare. And Geoffrey tells us that he based his book on earlier British sources, which are now lost, but if we believe him, then this is not just a story, it's true history. And I'm interested in all this as part of a bigger project I'm doing on the lost tomb of King Lear. But in this series of videos, I just want to concentrate on a small but crucial aspect, which is where Geoffrey associates King Lear with the god Janus. What he says is that after King Lear died, his daughter Cordelia buried her father in an underground chamber under the river Saw in Leicester. The chamber had been constructed in honour of Janus, the god with two faces. Now, Janus is a Roman god, so it's very strange to find him being honoured in Britain in 800 BC, which is 50 years before Rome was even founded. Let's have a look at the time chart. OK, here is the history of the world. The present is along the bottom, so time flows downwards. And the countries are arranged horizontally, so here is Italy. And here is the Roman Empire, this big purple patch, about 2,000 years ago. And here is the founding of Rome, around 750 BC. Then here is Britain, so this is the line of Britain. And here is the Roman Empire in Britain, around three or four hundred years. And what Geoffrey of Monmouth is telling us is that King Lear ruled around 800 BC, about 50 years before the founding of Rome. And another thing to notice from this chart is that before the Roman Empire in Britain, it's a complete blank. As far as historians are concerned, before the Romans came, nothing happened in Britain, or at least nothing that we know of which is rather strange considering that Geoffrey Monmouth is full of stories about this period, including, as we have seen, King Lear around 800 BC. So historians don't take Geoffrey terribly seriously, and in fact they think he basically made the whole thing up. And as far as this underground temple to Janus is concerned, if we look in something like Westwood and Simpson's Law of the Land, a guide to England's legends, we read... Evidently, Geoffrey had got wind of some buried structure found among Leicester's Roman remains. And the historian John Tatlock, in his book about Geoffrey, says, One may hazard a risky conjecture. The double-faced head of Janus was extremely common on Roman and provincial coins. It is possible that Janus coins were found in Roman cellars or other structures, and gave rise to a misguided local notion of a cavern shrine to Janus. So the idea is that people found this Roman cellar and a coin with Janus on it, and they put two and two together and made five and deduced that this was a temple to Janus. Well, that could be what happened, but just because some sceptical historian has speculated about it doesn't make it true. And I was struck by something I was reading the other day in the social theorist Nicholas Luhmann's Social Systems. He's talking about trust and distrust. And what he says is, as a strategy, trust possesses greater scope. Anyone who gives his trust considerably widens his potential for action. Distrust is a more constraining strategy. And I thought this applies to those historians who distrust Geoffrey. They dismiss what he says about an underground temple to Janus as a mistake for some Roman remains. And that's it. It's very constraining. It leads nowhere. And in fact, it leaves things unexplained, because why then did this become associated with King Lear? And what I want to do is show that if we decide to trust Geoffrey, i.e. assume that when he claimed to be drawing on ancient sources he was telling the truth, then we can unlock the meaning of this passage, and it will take us much further into the realms of witches, 
devil worship and aspects of the British past that have been almost completely forgotten.